Order. Questions to the Prime Minister. Tulip Siddiq. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I am sure that members from all sides of the House would like to join me in congratulating both the English and the Scottish women's football teams for their excellent performance in qualifying for next year's World Cup. Mr. Speaker, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others. In addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. Tulip Siddiq. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my constituent, Nazanin Zaghari Radcliffe, was released temporarily for three days last month before being hauled back to prison in Iran. Worse still, when she was on a furlough, she was contacted by the Iranian Revolutionary Guard saying that if she attempted to contact the British Embassy, her family would be harmed. I find it deeply troubling that a British citizen was threatened against contacting her own embassy. Does the Prime Minister share my concern, and will she raise the specific issue with President Rouhani when she next speaks to him, perhaps in New York later this month? Can I say to the Honourable Lady that I share the concerns that, that she has expressed, and our thoughts, I know, uh, across the whole House remain with Nazarene Zaghari Ratcliffe during this difficult time and with her family and her friends who have been campaigning tirelessly, obviously, for her release. The Honourable Lady will know, as this is her constituent, that one of the difficulties is the question of whether or not the Iranian uh, government recognises dual nationality, which they do not, and they are not obliged to under international law. She asks me to raise this matter with President Rouhani. I regularly do whenever I speak to President Rouhani. It is an issue also that the Foreign Secretary, the Foreign Office, other ministers consistently raise with the Iranian government, uh, and we will continue to do so. Maggie through. Anti Semitism has no place in British public life. Will my right hand friend assure the House? that she will always work to make sure that this remains the case. Can I say to my honourable friend, Jewish people living in this country should feel safe and secure and not have to worry about their futures in their own country. There is no place for racial hatred in our society, and it is important that we take every step to tackle it. That is why, as a government, we were the first country in the world to adopt the definition of anti-Semitism set out by the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance. We have been taking steps, providing funding to ensure security measures can be taken in Jewish faith schools and synagogues, and we have provided funding to the Holocaust Memorial Day Trust to run events for Holocaust Memorial Day. I believe that we should all be united in our determination to tackle anti-Semitism. So when the leader of the Labour Party stands up, he should apologise for saying that Jewish people who have lived in this country their whole lives do not understand English irony. Jeremy Corbyn. Mr Speaker, there is no place for racism in any form within our society. On that we are all agreed, and we should tackle it wherever it arises, in our own parties as well, and that includes the Conservative Party. I join, I join the Prime Minister in congratulating the English and Scottish women's teams on their uh, qualification for the World Cup, and I look, look forward to them doing extremely well. Mr Speaker, the International Trade Secretary said the likelihood of a no deal is now 60-40, which in betting parlance means it's a pretty good chance there won't be a deal, which means more likely than not. So, Prime Minister, is he right? Can I say, can I say to the right honourable gentleman, we are, we are continuing to do what we have always been doing, which is working to get a good deal with the European Union for our future relationship once we have left the European Union. But it is entirely right and proper that we should prepare for all eventualities, because we have not come to the end of the negotiations. That means that it is right that we are preparing for no deal, as indeed the European Union have been doing, sending out notices in relation to no deal. So we have been publishing technical notices so that businesses and citizens would know where they stand and how to prepare in the event of no deal. Uh, We have published over 20 so far, and the uh, final total is likely to be around 70. We are making those preparations, but crucially, what this Government is doing is working for a good deal 
preparing for every eventuality and preparing to ensure that this country makes success of leaving the EU regardless of the outcome of the negotiations. So, Mr Speaker, the International Trade Secretary says he's unfazed by no deal. The new Foreign Secretary who's here this morning says that uh, over the summer that a no-deal Brexit would be a huge geostrategic mistake. And the Chancellor who's sitting next to her has written to the Treasury Select Committee stating that a no-deal Brexit would slash GDP by almost 8%, comparable with the global financial crash. Which assessment does she agree with? The director of the World Trade Organization said that no deal would not be a walk in the park, but it wouldn't be the end of the world. The government is right. The government is right to make the necessary preparations for no deal, while at the same time we are working for a good deal to ensure that we deliver on the vote of the British people, uh, that we come out of the European Union on the 29th of March 2019, that we do so in a way that protects jobs and livelihoods, ensures no hard border between Northern Ireland and Ireland, and maintains the precious union of our United Kingdom. And on one thing, I am clear. We are working for that outcome, and we will not have a second referendum. He should stand up and rule out a second referendum. Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister says no deal is better than a bad deal. The Chancellor says no deal would cause a catastrophic collapse of our economy. And yesterday, the Brexit Secretary waded in to said, say that there were countervailing opportunities to a no deal Brexit. Could the Prime Minister enlighten us what these countervailing opportunities actually are? As I, as I said to the right honourable gentleman in answer to his first question, this government is working to ensure that whatever the outcome of the negotiations, this, government, this country makes success uh, of coming out of the European Union. We see that global Britain and a brighter future for people here in this country. But interestingly, I suggested to the right honourable gentleman, yet again, as I have done on other occasions, that he stand up and categorically rule out a second referendum. He refused to do so, so I'll give him another opportunity to do it now. Jeremy Corbyn. Uh, Mr Speaker, a majority of people might have voted to leave, but they expected the negotiations to be handled competently, and they certainly are not. And I didn't hear a single. I didn't hear a single one of these uh, countervailing opportunities. I say to the Prime Minister, quite simply, this: she can't keep dancing round all the issues. <laughs> and it seems that. Um, it seems, Mr. <clears throat> it seems, Mr. Speaker, that. Uh, Panasonic have taken the cue and have agreed to, decided to dance off altogether. They are relocating out of this country. Could the Prime Minister tell the House how many other companies have been in touch with her or her ministerial team and told her privately that they intend to relocate in the absence of a serious, sensible deal with the European Union? Can I say to the right honourable gentleman, what we have seen is businesses showing confidence in our economy. In August, Dyson announced £200 million of investment in their electric vehicle testing facility in Wiltshire. Two Sisters Food Group, Bernard Matthews, have won major new contracts with supermarkets, underpinning 600 new jobs. The Hutt Group have announced 200 new tech jobs in Salford. We welcomed £130 million of foreign direct investment in our automotive sector from four companies in July, generating around 500 new jobs. What we are doing is negotiating a Brexit deal that will deliver for this country, deliver on the vote of the British people, and that will ensure we do so protecting jobs, maintaining our union, and ensuring no hard border between Northern Ireland and Ireland. And what do we get from the right honourable gentleman? Uh, from the right honourable gentleman said that he wanted to do new trade deals. Now he wants to be in the customs union. Uh, at one stage, the right honourable gentleman was asked about his uh, view on free movement. He said, "Labour is not wedded to freedom of movement for EU citizens as a point of principle, but nor do we rule it out." So he can't even agree with himself on his own position. Norman. 
I'm not quite sure who the Prime Minister is listening to, but she may have heard. She may have heard from the National Farmers Union that says it will be an Armageddon scenario. The TUC says no, a no deal Brexit would be devastating for working people. The EU's chief negotiator and President Macron both seem to have categorically ruled out the Prime Minister's Chequers proposals. So we're now at a critical point. Can the Prime Minister tell the House if she believes a deal will be reached by the agreed deadline of October? That's October 2018, not any other one. I say to the right honourable gentleman. We are working for a good deal. We're still working, as are the European Union, for the timetable that was set of October, because we're leaving the European Union on the 29th of March 2019. We will need to pass legislation in this House prior to our leaving uh, the European Union. But he talks about no deal, that he talks about a deal. I'll tell him what will be bad for this country. That will be signing up to deal at any price whatsoever, which is the position of the Labour Party. That would destroy jobs. That would be bad for the British people. Jeremy Corbyn. Yesterday, the Brexit Secretary admitted there had been some slippage. Today, Lord King condemned the incompetence of the preparation, saying it beggars belief that the sixth biggest economy in the world should get itself into that position. Yeah. The Prime Minister has repeatedly said that no deal is better than a bad deal. But no deal is a bad deal. And everyone from the CBI to the TUC to her own Chancellor are telling her the same thing. The Chequers proposal is dead, already ripped apart by her own MPs. When will the Prime Minister publish a real plan that survives contact with her Cabinet and with reality? Those are, of course, two very separate concepts. When will we get proposals that put jobs and the economy ahead of the survival of herself and her own government? We have, we have published a plan that we are discussing with the European Union that ensures that we deliver on the vote of the British people, that ensures that we bring an end to free movement, that we come out of the CAP, come out of the common fisheries policy, no longer send vast amounts of money to the EU every year, no longer have the jurisdiction of the European Court of Justice here in this country, that we don't have a hard border between Northern Ireland and Ireland, and we don't have a border between Northern Ireland and Great Britain. What I'm doing is negotiating a Brexit deal for Britain. I'm making sure that the economy works for everyone. I'm building a stronger, fairer country. What's, what is the right honourable gentleman doing? He's trying, he's trying to change his party so anti-Semites can call the creation of Israel racist. And he should be ashamed of himself. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. The Prime Minister will be aware of the campaign to extend the Borders Railway from Tweedbank to Hoyk, Newcastleton and on to Carlisle. This will provide a huge boost to the local economy and will help demonstrate what Scotland's two governments can do for my region. So yeah. what will the Prime Minister do to ensure the sufficient resource and the Borderlands Growth Deal to allow this project to move forward? Yeah. Yeah. Can, I, can I say to my honourable friend that I understand the importance of, to partners across the region of the campaign and the proposal that he has referred to. I'm sure he understands this is a devolved transport issue, but I would certainly encourage all parties that are involved to come to a workable solution and to ensure the best outcome for the entire region, because this can bring great benefits. And uh, in addition to the point he made about the Borderlands Growth Deal, can I assure him that the UK and Scottish governments will continue to work in partnership to deliver that deal? Ian Blackford. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And can I congratulate Scotland and England in qualifying for the World Cup. Yeah. Yeah. All of us in Scotland are immensely proud of our Scottish women's team. Yeah, yeah. Mr Speaker, when the Tories introduced Thatcher's poll tax in the 1980s, Scotland was used as a guinea pig. Yeah. Yeah. The Scottish Tories paid a price for their folly. They were wiped off the political map of Scotland. The Prime Minister's checkers plan is even more unpopular than the poll tax. Why is the Prime Minister gambling with Scotland's future by taking us out of the EU against her will with her disastrous checkers plan? Yeah. Be 
The only people who are gambling with Scotland's future are the Scottish National Party who want to take Scotland out of the United Kingdom. Well, that was no answer to the question. I should remind the Prime Minister it's Prime Minister's question. Mr Speaker, Michelle Barnier has said that the Chequers plan is not acceptable. Mervyn King has called the government's preparations incompetent. Prime Minister, your Chequers plan is as dead as a dodo. With the clock ticking down, will the Prime Minister now finally concede that backing the single market and customs union is the only option to protect jobs, to protect the economy, <coughs> and to protect the Good Friday Agreement. Can I say to the uh, Can I say to the right honourable gentleman? that the, we have put forward a proposal under the Chequers Plan that protects jobs, that protects livelihoods, that ensures that we deliver on the vote of the British people, that ensures that we deliver on no hard border between Northern Ireland and Ireland, and maintain the union of the United Kingdom. Michelle Barnier has put forward a, uh, another proposal which keeps Northern Ireland in the customs union and uh, the single market, which is a free trade agreement only for Great Britain, which creates a border down the Irish Sea. I have said, and I have said that, I don't, uh, that it is unacceptable to me as Prime Minister, I believe there is no British Prime Minister who would find that deal acceptable that is being uh, proposed there. We are negotiating on the Chequers deal. It delivers for the United Kingdom. It delivers for the people of the whole of the United Kingdom. Eddie Hughes. Mr Speaker, Warsaw Manor Hospital serves many of my constituents, and it desperately needs a new and extended A&E department. With other hospitals in the black country supporting their bid, can the Prime Minister assure me that some of the £20 billion additional funding for the NHS is coming to Warsaw to improve A&E provision? Yeah. Can, I, can I say to my hon. Friend that we are committed to providing the local NHS with the funding they need? We, we have, as he knows, announced over £3.9 billion of new additional capital funding for the NHS up to 2022-23. We announced that last year. The majority support the implementation of plans from uh, local communities. I understand that the Walsall Healthcare NHS Trust have resubmitted an application for the £36.2 million of funding in July for the Walsall Manor Hospital Emergency Department. The Department of Health and Social Care, Care expect the successful schemes to be announced in the autumn, but my right hon. Friend, the Health Secretary, will be pleased to meet my hon. Friend to discuss his campaign. Now, Brendan O'Hara. Yeah. <laughs> Rural Scotland, including my Argyll and Butte constituency, is facing a depopulation crisis, a crisis that will be exacerbated by Brexit. Last week, Cleland Sneddon, the chief executive of Argyll and Butte Council, added his name to those calling for a more flexible, devolved and regional immigration policy and offered Argyll and Butte as a test case and a pilot area to test this. Will the Prime Minister agree to meet with myself and the Chief Executive of Argyll and Butte to discuss the merits of such a proposal? Yeah. Can I welcome the Honourable Gentleman to asking uh, a question here at the uh, PMQs, but can I say to him, he has asked a question about a regional immigration policy, which is actually something which the Migration Advisory Committee looked at a while back and made very clear uh, that this was not a situation that they felt the government should accept because of the practical problem, uh, partly because of the practical problems in implementing that. When we uh, put forward our proposals for uh, the immigration policy for people coming from the European Union, we will be ensuring that we put forward proposals that are right for the whole of the United Kingdom. Amber Rudd. PNR, these are all EU-wide databases, a lot of which the UK helped to shape, which keep us safe. While there is much debate here about the type of trading arrangement we will have with the EU, can I ask the Prime Minister for reassurance that there will still be the highest level of security arrangement with the EU as we leave the European Union, because any reduction in that is completely unacceptable to the people of the UK. Yeah. Can I, can I, 
say to my right honourable friend that she is absolutely right to highlight the importance of our security relationship with the EU. I remember the discussions, the debates that led to the establishment of the, uh, of the PNR directive. Uh, the White Paper does provide a comprehensive and ambitious vision for that future security relationship, and that is why we are proposing that security partnership to protect our shared law enforcement and criminal justice capabilities, facilitate continued cooperation, and support our joint working on security issues such as counter terrorism. And Michel Barnier has recognised the progress made in our discussions on security. So our focus should be on trying to obtain, obtain and define that ambitious and unprecedented partnership, which will help to keep not just people here safe, but people across the whole of the EU safe. Yeah. 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 Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. The opening of the V&A Museum of Design next week in my city of Dundee is already attracting worldwide attention, expecting to have up to half a million visitors in its first year. <laughs> will drive millions of pounds into the local economy. The Prime Minister will also be aware that an announcement to confirm funding for the Tay Cities deal is imminent and that improved connectivity is key to driving the prosperity of the Tay City region. Therefore, as an air link to Dundee was part of Heathrow's successful bid for the third runway, will the Prime Minister today express a firm commitment for the introduction of a new direct air service to Dundee by 2021 and the associated investment required to secure this? Well, can, I, can I say to the Honourable Gentleman, he's right to uh, bring to the attention of the House the, both the D side deal and the, uh, as he says, the opening of the VNA in Dundee. Uh, these are important ways in which the UK government is working to ensure that support for, uh, for Scotland and that, uh, those opportunities in relation to the Scottish economy. Another one of those is the fact that this is the government that has taken the decision to enable a third runway to go ahead at Heathrow, and we do expect when that happens that we will see better, in, better connectivity within the United Kingdom. Henry Smith. Speaker, this September is Blood Cancer Awareness Month and therefore I'm delighted that yesterday it was announced the NHS will be providing innovative CAR T cell immune therapy to under 25s, uh, the first health system uh, anywhere in Europe to do so. Can I seek assurances from my right and more friend, the Prime Minister, that a focus on blood cancer awareness and diagnosis and prevention will continue into the future. Yeah. Well, can, I, can I first of all commend my honourable friend for the work that he has done to champion the cause of blood cancer and uh, raising a much greater awareness of this issue. And I can assure him that this will continue uh, to be an issue that we want to, uh, to press on and continue to raise awareness of. And uh, like him, I, I'm pleased that the government has been able to make that the decision has been able to be made, as he referred to, was, an, uh, was announced yesterday. But once again. I congratulate my honourable friend because he has personally campaigned on this and championed this cause. Dr. Rupa Hart. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Prime Minister and I both have seats <coughs> around Heathrow Airport and both campaigned for years against its damaging effects on our constituents and its expansion. But when it came to the third runway vote, she shifted. If I can understand her change of heart because new facts emerged and it wasn't the same proposal as it was years ago, can she not apply the same logic and, apply, and allow the electorate the final say on the final Brexit deal? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Can I say to the uh, can I say to the honourable lady an ingenious attempt to raise that uh, uh, that, that uh, Brexit issue? This. This Parliament, this Parliament gay, overwhelmingly gave the decision to the British people as to whether to remain or leave the European Union. The British people voted. It is now up to this Government and, I believe, politicians across the whole House to show our faith with the British people and deliver on their vote. Damien Green. Time when this House will inevitably be, be spending a lot of time discussing Brexit. Uh, I think it's important we should concentrate uh, on other issues, and for many families, their own children's future uh, is a very immediate concern. With that in mind, does the Prime Minister agree that making sure as many children as possible grow up in a household where someone is working is not only the best way to provide a secure economic background for children, but also the best way of ensuring that future generations are prepared to play a full productive role in society. Can I say I absolutely agree with my right honourable friend. Work is the best route out of poverty, but I think it's also important uh, for the uh, example it gives to children in 
uh, households when they see a, par a parent or parents working. I'm pleased to say that we now see uh, that the levels in relation to children being brought up in workless households is at the lowest level that we've seen. This is very important. We know that three quarters of children move out of poverty when their parents go into full-time work. For the example it shows, for the benefit it brings to those children, for the benefit it brings to the family and the benefits for our society as a whole, ensuring that, we provide, that the jobs are provided so those people can be in work for the future of their children is important. Mr Varendra Sharma. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Will the Prime Minister commit to securing and simplifying the future for people up and down the UK and pledge to protect the pensions Dashboard. Well, can, I, can I say to the honourable gentleman that I believe that the responsible minister has made an announcement about the fact that the pensions dashboard will be going ahead, and I think there will be some piloting and uh, a consultation on looking at that. John Hayes. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister appreciates the plight of the poorest Britons who, when they've loved and lost, struggle to be able to afford to provide a dignified and decent funeral, because she established the Children's Funeral Fund. Nevertheless, the uh, grant available to the poorest people for this purpose has been frozen at £700 since 2003, and 30% uh, of people get nothing at all. The Right Hon. Member Birkenhead's Select Committee recommended changes in 2016. Will she meet me and him and others? It's not just our task or our duty, it's our mission to help to heal the brokenhearted. Can I, can I say to uh, my right honourable friend that obviously he has raised an important and sensitive issue, and none of us want to see a situation where people are not able to afford to do that what is a, 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 a terrible task in that they have seen a loved one die, but to be able to give them a proper funeral uh, and is important to families and to individuals. As he will know, the funeral expenses payments do continue to cover the necessary costs involved with funerals and cremations and up to £700 for other funeral expenses. And Some changes have been made to ensure that other contributions are not uh, deducted from the funeral expenses payment, so that there is no uh, change to that. Can I suggest to my right honourable friend um, that the position that he has put forward sounds to me like a budget submission, which uh, he might wish to put forward to my right honourable friend, the Chancellor of the Exchequer? Meg Hillier. Mr Speaker, because of funding pressures, many schools are cutting short the school week. So what's the Prime Minister's message to parents whose children will be out of school for half a day a week? Can I say to the Honourable Lady, first of all, first of all, I think we should all pay tribute to the work that our teachers and head teachers do across the country. And I'm pleased, I'm pleased that 1.9 million more children are now in good or outstanding schools. We're backing, uh, we're backing schools with an extra 1.3 billion over the next two years. Per pupil funding being protected in real terms. But we're doing more than that. The Department for Education is working with schools to help reduce their non-staffing uh, costs. That includes up to £1 billion through better procurement. That means that teachers will be able to do what they do best, which is carry on teaching. Julian Knight. Mr Speaker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Last Monday in Solihull, the lives of a mother and daughter, Kola Salim and Renim Uday, were brought to an end after a double stabbing outside their home. I have met with Kola and Renim's family, seen firsthand their quiet dignity, clear love for one another and desire to see something good come from their loss. Would the Prime Minister join me in sending our thoughts and prayers to Kola and Renim's family and thanking our emergency services, police liaison officers and the wider community of Solihull, which has shown great stoicism and heartfelt concern as this tragedy has unfolded? Yeah. Well, can I say to my honourable friend, I think the whole House will want to join me in sending our deepest sympathies to the families and loved ones of Kola Salim and Renim Uda. 
Uh, this is a terrible tragedy. I, I'm sure my honourable friend understands. I can't comment on the ongoing investigation that is taking place, but he is right to draw attention to the work of the emergency services. And indeed, I will join him in paying tribute not only to our emergency services, but also to the local community for the support that they have shown at this very difficult time. Tonia Antoniazzi. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Speaker. According to the patients' group End Our Pain, there has been a near total refusal of NHS trusts to back applications for medical cannabis. The Home Secretary has only paid lip service to two high-profile cases and not proposed a workable solution for other desperate children and adults across the UK. Now, the Prime Minister could show real leadership and solve this for hundreds of families, but will she? to the Honourable Lady that, first of all, I offer deepest sympathies to those who are suffering severe conditions where other treatments have not been effective and that these cannabis-based medicinal products have the potential to help. That is why the Home Secretary has announced that the law will be changed so specialist clinicians will be able to prescribe, legally prescribe cannabis-based medicinal products to patients with an exceptional clinical need. Now, while that change is taking place, the expert panel has been established, an expert panel of clinicians, as an interim to ensure that treatment is safe and effective. So we're not just waiting for the legislation to change. We will change the law, but we've also put in place a procedure to ensure that those cases can be considered properly. Bob Neill. Thank you, Mr Speaker. On Monday, honourable and right honourable members from across the House will join the people of Gibraltar in celebrating their National Day on the 10th of September. Will my right honourable friend confirm that it is Her Majesty's Government's full resolve that Gibraltar and its people will be fully included in all aspects of the withdrawal negotiations and future arrangements, and that no other party will have any veto on that? Can I, can I say to my honourable friend, I am very happy to give him that reassurance and that commitment from on behalf of this Government, and can I say that I send best wishes to the people of Gibraltar for their celebrations on the 10th of September? Yassine. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, last year, Bedford Maternity Unit closed its doors six times due to uh, capacity and staffing issues. This is disgraceful. Will she admit now that staffing of our NHS of funds has had very devastating consequences? And will she now reinstate the nursing bursaries to address the shameful national shortage of 3,500 midwives and fund our NHS properly? Yeah. Can I simply point out to the honourable gentleman that health funding in his area will be 1.5 billion this year, and thanks to our funding commitments, this is an increase of over 60 million pounds on the previous year, a cash increase of 4.2 per cent. The Bedfordshire Clinical Commissioning Group will receive a cash increase of 4.34 per cent on last year. We are putting extra money into the National Health Service, but more than that, we have committed future funding, a five-year funding programme and a ten-year plan for the National Health Service to deliver the services that patients need. Steve Baker. Speaker, with Exit Day day fast approaching, will my right honourable friend now give instructions to the whole of government that the the first priority of every department must be domestic preparedness whether we leave the EU with a, with a deal or without. Yeah. Well, can I first of all commend uh, my honourable friend for the work that he did when he was a minister on this particular issue? Can I assure him, can I assure him that the Brexit Department, the uh, Department for Exiting the European Union, is indeed, uh, has indeed stepped up it, the work on preparations. Um, we have 6,400 civil servants working on EU exit. There's an additional 1,850 recruited in the pipeline, so we can accelerate preparations as necessary. We've passed necessary laws, such as the EU Withdrawal Act and Historic Act, passed in this House. Uh, obviously, there are other pieces of legislation, like the Sanctions Act, the Nuclear Safeguards Bill. We're publishing the technical notices on no deal preparations. We are ensuring that our preparations are being made, and our preparations are made for every eventuality. We are working for a good deal. We prepare for every eventuality. F. Smith. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Does the Prime Minister agree with the Chief Constable of Greater Manchester when he says, after losing 2,000 officers in eight years, that the public have to accept that without more resources it is impossible 
for the police to respond to crimes like car break-ins, antisocial behaviour, even property theft. Yeah. 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 Is that just the reality of policing under this government? Yeah, or will the Prime yeah. Minister commit to give our police the funding they need? Yeah. Yeah. I say to the honourable gentleman that obviously we understand uh, the demand on policing, that that is changing. It is becoming increasingly complex, and that's why, after speaking to forces in England and Wales, we provided a comprehensive funding settlement that will increase total investment in the police system by over £460 million in this year, 2018-19. And uh, he might like to note that the force has a higher number of officers per head of population than the England and Wales average. Alberto Costa. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Earlier this morning, my daughter Sophie, on her own merit, along with thousands of other school children, attended her first day in grammar school. What message does the Prime Minister have for my daughter Sophie and the thousands of other children who, as I say, on their own merit, secured a place at grammar school? What can I say? uh, First, I would say well done to his daughter Sophie and those others. Secondly, I would say... Secondly, I would say to Sophie and others, this is a country where how far you get on in life should depend on how hard you work and your talents and abilities. A good good education is crucial to that. So I would say enjoy your time at school, make the best of your time at school, because education is the key that unlocks the door to your future. Mike Kane. Mr Speaker, 25,000 jobs and 30 million passengers depend upon Manchester Airport in my constituency. But with no World Trade Organisation fallback position after Brexit, can the Prime Minister explain why the Government has downgraded the possibility of an aviation sector deal? Now, I can say to the, uh, I can say to the honourable gentleman, not only are we, of course, making sure that the arrangements in relation to aviation uh, will be what they should be when we leave the European Union, but we have been working with the aerospace sector uh, generally and with aviation to ensure that, as we've been put in place our modern industrial strategy, we see the jobs being not just maintained but also created uh, across the country that provide those high-skilled high, uh, uh, and well-paid jobs for people in these important sectors. And aviation is an important sector for the UK. Andrea Jenkins. Thank you, Mr Speaker. In this year's local election, we elected my first Conservative councillor in the constituency, a wonderful lady called Nick. But since her election, she's been subjected to the most awful abuse by Labour and Momentum activists. Police have been called to her home several times, they have hung around her home late at night. One has allegedly trolled her via his dead wife's social media account. Her special needs son is now too scared to leave the house. Would the Prime Minister join me in condemning this abhorrent intimidation of elected officials? Is this supposed to be the kind of gentler politics of the Labour Party? Can I, can I, can I first of all say to my honourable friend that I congratulate, I think it's Lynn who has been, who, for her election. Can I say I'm sorry that she has been subjected to this appalling series of attacks of various sorts since that election? Across our democracy, we have different opinions about what we want to achieve, sometimes about how we achieve what we want to achieve. But it is right that we are able to put those opinions forward. The democratic process means we put our views to the public and the public choose as they have chosen my honourable friend's constituent to represent them on the council. And she should be able to get on with that job of representing her constituents free of hatred and free of the abuse that she appears to be getting. And I say that this should be condemned on all sides of this house. Thank you, Mr Speaker. It has been reported this morning that the Treasury and Number 10 are blocking plans for legally binding three-year tenancies for private renters. This is of great concern to private renters in my constituency, including many families sending their children back to school this week, not knowing where they will be living this time next year. Will the Prime Minister make a clear promise to private tenants that they will be entitled to three-year tenancies in law? Yeah. 
Can I, can I say to the Honourable Lady that we are keen to support tenants to access longer, more secure tenancies, whilst also ensuring obviously landlords are able to uh, recover their property when needed. The consultation on overcoming the barriers to longer tenancies in the private rented sector closed on the 26th of August. It considered the various barriers to longer tenancies and how to overcome them. It did propose a new three-year tenancy model with a six-month break clause. We asked for views on viability and on how that could be implemented. We are now analysing those responses and we will provide information on the next steps once we have done that. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I know my right hon. Friend will be as concerned as me and as I am sure the whole House to hear of and see the carcasses of nearly 90 elephants Mm. near a wildlife sanctuary in Botswana. This coincides with Botswana's anti-poaching unit being disarmed. Will she do more to tackle this scourge, including through our aid budget, to fund more rangers and more training through the MOD? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can I say to my honourable friend that the whole issue of the illegal wildlife trade is a very important one. Uh, it was an issue that I touched on when I was in uh, South Africa, in fact, in the presence of, uh, and there was a minister from Botswana there at the time. We are holding a major conference later this year on the illegal wildlife trade um, because we see it is important and we are bringing people together across the international community to consider how we can further deal with this. Chris Rain. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, prominent Tory Brexiteers promised that Wales would not lose out on funding if it voted to lose, uh, leave the EU. Wales has received £5.3 billion in European structural funds since 2000, the highest level in the UK and Europe. Will the Prime Minister guarantee, here and now, that Wales will not lose out on these fundings should the UK leave the EU? First of all, can I say to the Honourable Gentleman, he says, should the UK leave the EU? The UK is leaving the European Union, and that will happen on the 29th of March next year. What we will be doing is what we are doing is reassessing, uh, looking at the structural funds that have come from the European Union in the past. We are setting up the Shared Prosperity uh, Fund. That will ensure that we are looking at disparities within regions and between and, and within nations and between the nations of the United Kingdom. And we are working to ensure that we have a system and a deal with the European Union for the future that works for the whole of the United Kingdom. Gillian Keegan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Like my right hon. Friend, I have also recently returned from Africa where I visited a refugee camp in Tanzania with PLAN, witnessing the transformative impact of UK aid protecting women from sexual violence and giving children access to education. With the UN General Assembly fast approaching, can the Prime Minister outline what preparations she has made for the Global Compact on Refugees? Can I say to uh, my hon. Friend that, yes, we are looking at... It's not just us looking at what is uh, being proposed in terms of the Global Compact for Refugees. We have actually been part of the discussions about what should be in that Global Compact for Refugees, and this partly reflects the speech that I gave, uh, uh, one of the speeches I gave when I was at Unger in 2016, shortly after I became Prime Minister, about the need for us to look at as internationally how we deal with migration and refugees, and I want to see a better ability to um, differentiate between illegal economic migrants and refugees, because I think that by doing that, we will be able to ensure that we are providing the support necessary for refugees. Mr Vincent Cable. Uh, can the Prime Minister explain why the process by which European nationals acquire settled status requires 59 pages of guidance? Isn't this simply providing 59 ways of saying no in a continued hostile environment? Can I say to the right hon. Gentleman that the, uh, the system, as he will know, was, uh, was launched uh, not that long ago. It is very clear. It's an online system. It's a simple system. We guarantee that that would be what uh, we provided and is what we have delivered. Exactly. Stephen Kerr. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, Wilkins is a central Scotland department store and over the years has become something of an institution in Stirling and it recently announced that it was to close. While the Scottish Government continue to delay any changes to the business rate system in Scotland, which is killing our high street, can the Prime Minister assure me that there will be some action to level the playing field between high street businesses and online sellers? Can I say to uh, my honourable friend that he's right to highlight the importance 
of using the tax system in a responsible way. This is very important. Businesses, it's right that businesses make a contribution to their local area through the business rates, but this should be as fair as possible. That's why we've improved the system and made changes worth over £10 billion to businesses, including taking 600,000 small businesses out of paying business rates altogether. Um, because Britain's retailers, be they high street shops or independent traders, are a crucial part of our economy. They create jobs. They inject billions into our economy. And I think all those responsible for these tax systems should deal with them responsibly and recognise the impact that the decisions they make have. I think we should wrap up with a new young member seeking to make an early mark, Mr Geoffrey Robinson. Is the Prime Minister aware that next Wednesday, 12th of September, we have the committee stage for my private member's bill uh, organ donation deemed consent. Uh, I wish to thank her personally for the tremendous support she has given, and of course my right hon- my right honourable friend, the leader of the opposition. Her support and the government time and the gov- and the minister's support has been vital. Can she assure us she can sustain that support now through committee stage? In which case we can have it through the Commons procedures by the end of the year and have an act on the statute book early in the new year. An act I think the whole House would be pleased to see, an act whose sole purpose, Mr Speaker, is to save, preserve, enhance lives. Thank you. Say to the Honourable Gentleman that this is an important this is an important piece of legislation. As he says, it will make a difference to people's lives. And uh, we have, as he said, given it our backing. We will continue to give this legislation uh, our backing precisely because of the importance and the impact it will have on people. Thank you.